Good afternoon. Welcome to a Friday Daily Press Briefing. I have a few items at the top, and then I will turn it over to you, Matt, in your summer jacket, which I like. On Libya, the United States welcomes today's announcement that the UN-facilitated Libyan political dialogue will resume again on June 8th in Morocco. Libya's crisis can only be solved through a political, not a military solution. Libyan stakeholders participating in the UN dialogue are working to preserve Libya's sovereignty and territorial integrity as they finalize discussions on a draft political agreement that will form a national unity government. We commend the efforts of the United Nations and Special Representative to the Secretary General, Bernardino Leone, in facilitating these discussions. In support of these talks, Deputy Secretary Blinken smoked, spoke this morning to Libyan House of Representatives President Aguila Saleh Issa and Nuri Abu Sahman of the former General National Congress. Blinken highlighted our strong support for both groups' decisions to attend the upcoming political dialogue and urged their support of the finalized political agreement and the establishment of a new national unity government as soon as possible. All Libyans will benefit from the end of the military conflict and increase security and stability. A strong, unified government will again be the best defense against any terrorist threat, uh, which has taken advantage of the current political environment. A couple more items, guys. Thanks for hanging with me here. On Macedonia, Deputy Secretary Blinken met uh, this morning as well with EU Commissioner Hahn to discuss the recent EU Eastern Partnership Summit in Riga and EU policy to the east, particularly focusing on Ukraine, Georgia, Serbia, Macedonia, Bosnia, and Moldova. With respect to Macedonia, the Deputy Secretary welcomed Commissioner Hahn's successful mediation efforts earlier this week and praised Macedonia's government and opposition leaders for reaffirming on June 2nd their commitment to Euro-Atlantic principles, inter-ethnic relations, and good neighborly relations in preparation for early elections by the end of April 2016. The Deputy Secretary underscored that while the path forward will not be easy for Macedonia, the United States, together with our European partners, will be actively engaged to support Macedonia in meeting these challenges and ultimately the goal of Euro-Atlantic integration. Two more quick things, and I promise the floor is yours, Matt. An update on Secretary Kerry. Secretary Kerry continues to recover in Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Uh, his doctors feel he, was, he is on schedule with his recovery, which is proceeding normally, uh, if not better than expected. He has been exercising, walking several times yesterday and again today, uh, and also resting, though, and letting his broken bone heal. He plans to take advantage of the weekend to continue this routine and then make decisions about the days ahead. This morning, he has already spoken with National Security Advisor Susan Rice, received briefings from Chief of Staff John Finer, Counselor Tom Shannon. I believe if he hasn't already, he will be speaking again uh, with Under Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, who you all know is in Vienna, continuing the Iran negotiations. And then the last item at the top, which is more of a personal item, uh, I think as many of you know, I started my new position on Monday uh, as Senior Advisor on Strategic Communications to Secretary Kerry that's focused on big strategic priorities, and most importantly, of course, uh, the Iran negotiation. So it's time to get to work on that. So today will be my last briefing <laughs> at this podium uh, after about two years, just about two years. Uh, and it's been an ex exciting, interesting two years. If you think the Iran talks were still in the secret channel when I started this, Cuba policy was what? Uh, decades? Also, <laughs> also in a secret channel, that is true. Good point, uh, James Rosen. Uh, you know, Russian tanks weren't in eastern Ukraine, and also just sort of the daily uh, business of diplomacy. So uh, given all that's going on, that's why we do this every day, why I know you do this every day as well. Uh, the only podium who briefs every day, no matter where the secretary is. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the last two years. It's been fun. It's been interesting. It's been, at times, uh, very difficult for all the issues we all cover and face. So with that, I won't get too emotional, but thank you. And we'll do a good briefing today. Right. We'll make it a good one to go well, out on. <laughs> and uh, Jeff will be briefing next week. And then John and Mark, uh, as soon as they're ready, will be up here as well. Right. And right. there have been things like the lights going off. Mm -hmm. Remember when the podium broke? We've had some interesting times in the last two years. Yes. Yes, we have. <laughs> it certainly is the end of an era. It is. I'm not sure what <laughs> era it will be called. We'll leave that to Saki historians. And <laughs> And internet philosophers, but thank philosophers you for is a nice word for them. Showing up every day and doing what you did. Um, it's been it, fun. It, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that you're, is that an honest assessment of being fun? 
Yes. You're the spokesperson who launched a thousand memes. Your Twitter legions of fans and foes, yes. I'm sure, will be I'm sure disappointed they will miss. in here. We'll miss but it. anyway, we but will. We'll still be all be talking on these issues. We'll also be working together. You'll still all be uh, coming to me for questions on things. It'll just be uh, not at the podium. And so. Mm -hmm. It's been a it's been a long uh, and interesting and important few years. So thank we will you. We certainly miss you. Right, getting down. To getting business. down to business. I'm touched by that display of emotion on your part, by the way. <laughs> For Matt, Matt, that's actually <laughs> that's actually guys. No, uh, that was effusive. <laughs> Well, I don't know, James, would you like to say a word or two? I think I speak for everyone who is a regular in this room, which I can't even include myself in that grouping, in saying that we all appreciated the, um, the grasp of the issues and the um, passion and conviction you brought to, you, to your defense of this administration and your engagement with us. And to the extent there was very harsh criticism, only some small measure was probably self-inflicted, <laughs> uh, and it, 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 it tended not to come from people who dealt with you on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Side. I'd like to say one thing. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks well, thanks for your late night endeavors. I know that <laughs> a lot of these stuff has been going on late into the night and you've taken our emails and That's true. responded and we appreciate that. Thank you. Well, uh, look, in some respects, you're covering, we all care about the same issues. We're coming from it from a different perspective, but uh, <clears throat> we're all doing this so the American people and the world knows what we do in this building. So. With that, let's get down to business. Right. So um, I want to ask a good first question, Matt. Come uh, well, on. Well, you know, I'm, I'm afraid it's not particularly good. <laughs> no pressure. But it is, uh, but it is important okay. question. Um, and it and, and it, but it goes back to this IAEA report mm -hmm. and the Iran and the what uh, better and, place to start yes, today? Yes, and the and the uranium. So I don't know if you've seen this um, two-page thing that. Uh, David Albright? Yes. Yes. The good ISIS. The good ISIS. No. Yes, I have. I actually have it right here. Okay. So, I briefly looked at it earlier. Okay. Well, the main point, other than this stuff about shooting messengers, is not going to make the issue go away, blah, right. blah, blah. The, 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 the crux of this is that they say, as they were cited in the story mm -hmm. that you took issue with, that they are skeptical about whether Iran is actually going to be able to Correct. make this problem deal with it. And right, right. They say that sort of the notion that they have to get back down there at a certain time, they sort of agree with many of the things we've said. I think they're skeptical right. uh, that Iran technically can do it. But they say... Uh, given the stridency of their criticisms, meaning this meaning administration, ours. Yes. of those who have raised the oxidation issue, mm -hmm. the State Department should explain the basis for their confidence. Can you do that? Well, uh, again, as we've said, in both the original JPOA and in the first extension, Iran converted enough of this material, this uh, LEU, from uranium hexafluoride, the form that it was in it as, as it was produced uh, in the centrifuges, to another chemical form such that Iran reduced the overall stockpile uh, back under the limit. Uh, the other chemical form of uranium uh, is much more difficult for Iran to use in a breakout scenario. Uh, our experts anticipate Iran will have no problem converting the excess uranium hexafluoride produced during the second extension in the same way. So again, uh, we have seen them do this twice. Uh, the IAEA has uh, taken note of this process before. And we, our experts, uh, anticipate Iran won't have challenges doing that. I understand that uh, David Albright is skeptical. And again, if we're standing here on June 30th and Iran hasn't done it, then they will uh, be in violation of the JPOA. Okay, but can you explain the reason? Is the re basis for your confidence, it, it, is, is that... Is your confidence based on the fact, on only the fact that they managed no, to do it? No, to do it before. before. I think it's based on two things primarily. One is that they have done it before, which uh, shows that they know how to do it and they're capable of doing it. And also, we've had technical discussions at an expert level with them about this process. And uh, that is why our assessment is that we uh, believe and anticipate they will be able to get back down where they need to. Okay. But... Uh, I'm, I'm still, I mean, that doesn't really explain that. I mean, the, I can understand why you would say that the basis for your confidence was that they had done it in the, they, in a, they in a process before, that's been outlined publicly. But I don't get the second part of why that's, uh, I mean, you're, you're basically taking them at their word. So, that, no, because no. we've had technical discussions with them about how they are going about doing this and will go about doing it. Uh, they've proven they can do it technically and from a technological perspective. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, what, 
what the skepticism is on, on David Albright's side from a technical perspective. I'm happy to get one of our nuclear experts uh, to, to debate the finer points of this with him. But having talked to our team, uh, the fact is they know how to do this. They've done it before. We're talking to them about the current stockpile and how they're going to get it down to the form uh, that is acceptable and the level that's acceptable. But wouldn't it be, be, wouldn't it be in the best interest of the deal and the administration and the rest of the world who are watching this, uh, the, these negotiations unfold, if you were to be a little bit more skeptical of Iran, Iran's intentions and, uh, and abilities uh, in this? Well, I'm, look, Matt, on this one, one, you know, issue, which is a one smallly defined issue, right? This isn't about their intentions overall. This isn't about their capabilities overall. On whether they can get down under 7850, on that very narrow issue, um, technically they know how to do it. Technically they've demonstrated twice before that they can, and we've talked to them about how they're going to. So it's not that we just take them at their word. We've seen their actions to do so. And again, if they don't, that will be a problem. The bigger technical question when it comes to a final deal, right, this is a question for JPOA implementation, this actually isn't really a question for the final negotiations, is how they will get down to 300 kilograms. Right. And so these are both important issues, but they're just a little separate. Uh, and the discussions are ongoing about how they'll get down to 300 kilograms. There's several ways they can do it. They can down blend it, they can ship it uh, out of the country, they can sell it on the open market. But those are two separate processes from getting down to 7850. That is something, quite frankly, technically we've seen them do. We don't have reason to think they won't be able to do it now when they could, you know, six months ago. Can I yes. follow on this? Yes. Um, can I go on this? Sorry, sure. there's just, uh, I want to You can both ask out. questions about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to concentrate on the, um, <clears throat> on the process of turning it from the uranium hexafluoride into the oxide. Into the other chemical form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is you, in, in previous days this week, you have said that your experts fully understand why it is that Iran has not, uh, why it is that the, that the amounts have gone up and down, that right. the LU have Correct. gone up and down. What ultimately is the reason for the increase, I mean, not so much for the <laughs> increase, but for their apparent inability or choice not to convert the increased amounts of low enriched uranium into the other form? Well, they are doing that. I, I think, again, going back to the IAEA report is a snapshot uh, of a stockpile on one date. So it's not, this isn't stagnant, that um, it's not that they have an inability to convert it. In fact, they have been. Uh, and uh, we've seen them uh, because, I mean, in a basic, very basic level, the reason the stockpile goes up and goes down is because they are allowed to enrich this very small uh, stockpile and type uh, of uranium hexafluoride. And so this is the product of that. But under the JPOA, they have to convert it before the end of the time. And they've been able to do that. Uh, again, I would not... Uh, I would venture to guess that the stockpile today probably isn't the same as it was the, that on that snapshot in time the day the IAEA uh, reported. And they have said publicly and to us that by June 30th they will get where they need to be. And our experts anticipate they'll be able to do so. The question that I still don't understand, though, mm -hmm. is I fully understand that they're allowed to enrich right. up to 5%, right. Right? right? And I fully understand that they're under an obligation by the six monthly deadlines to have converted right. beyond the... January 2014 levels. So my real question is, what is it, what is your understanding of why the conversion uh, has happened at a fish at, at such a pace that uh, there has been the buildup? Uh, you say that's not an inability. Is it just they're just choosing not to convert at the? It's a good question. So I would have to go back and look at the numbers for what the up and downs were, uh, the highs and lows during the previous two uh, time periods. But uh, I guess I can't stand up here and make the assumption that this is being converted at a slower weight rate. This may have been the exact same way they did it earlier. And I'm not sure. We would have to all go back and look at the numbers. It's an interesting question. I don't think, though, I have the evidence in front of me. I don't think any of us, I don't think we've seen any evidence that they're converting it more slowly. Now I can check on that. And then if yeah. if it does what, happen, sort of when it went up and down and at what point well, the reason you know, I'm they, to, they converted it. The reason I'm trying to get at it is it's not just how much uranium they're enriching, mm -hmm. but it's also the speed at which they are converting that 
enriched uranium. And you said that you guys, that your technical experts understood all of this. Yes, they And do. so I'm particularly interested in their Speed. understanding of mm -hmm. why it is that the conversion process mm -hmm. has been at a pace that so that there have been that there's been this buildup in the LAU. right and my I, and I, yes and I understand the question I'm happy to check with our team of to follow up on that though I'm not sure it's a different pace than it was before I just I just don't both. I, right, both I just don't questions. know that so okay. I will I will uh, I'll check on that Thank you. yes James. speed matters but also timing matters and so mm -hmm. the question I have for you is whether the two previous instances you keep alluding to uh, where the Iranians successfully came down mm -hmm. to the levels they were expected to come down to uh, involved time frames similar to the one we see now, or uh, is the way? current time frame less than the time they had to to reduce right. the stockpile previously? It's a question I just I don't know the answer to, and well, I'm happy to, to check. You have uh, twice in recent days, today and one previous day this week, acknowledged that if the Iranians fail to reduce mm -hmm. their LEU stockpile by June 30th to the required level, they would indeed be in violation of the JPOA. <coughs> From where Secretary Kerry sits, and we know he's just sitting right now. He's uh -huh. been up today. Okay. <laughs> From where Secretary Kerry sits, uh, would the uh, fact that the Iranians would be in violation in such a scenario as you yourself have mm -hmm. raised on the 30th of June prevent the United States or any of the P5 plus 1 from going forward with an agreement? That's a good question. I think, you know, there are so many things that could happen on June 30th. Look, the goal of June 30th is to get to a comprehensive agreement. And in an ideal world, we would have an agreement on that day uh, that says, you know, what their stockpile is on that day, 7650 is where they need to be, and how they're going to get very quickly early in implementation down to 300 kilograms. You yourself from the podium have stated uh, uh, that it would be a problem if they're not at that yes, level by June 30th. that is true. What so that might, a, how that might impact, I'm just not going to speculate. But in other words, you're, prepa you're not prepared to say that if the Iranians are not in full compliance on the 30th of June with all of their JPOA obligations, that that pro pre presents any particular impediment to going forward. I think I'm just uh, quite honestly not going to speculate on how that would impact exactly what happens on that day. Uh, there's a One different way, yeah. if I might. Mm -hmm. It is not a condition for going forward with an agreement it is not a condition for finalizing an agreement that Iran be in compliance with all JPOA uh, terms at the, at the end of the negotiating period? Well, uh, let's just first to make a few points. Uh, Iran has and continues to be in compliance. So as of today, they are in compliance with all of their obligations under the JPOA, as are we and all of our other parties who are party to the JPOA. Uh, what we are trying to do is translate the parameters document, which is separate from the JPOA, uh, translate that into uh, a comprehensive agreement and all the detailed annexes. So, of course, uh, Iran needs to be in compliance with the JPOA. That's very important to us. Uh, what is equally as important to us is getting a comprehensive agreement that they will also live up to. So those things are working uh, at the same time right now. But it's not a deal breaker if they're not fully in compliance. I just don't want to speculate on, on what this might look like on June 30th. We can have that conversation at wherever we are in the world on, on June 29th. Let's say that. <laughs> yep. Snapshot in time. What does that mean? Is that just the IA... particular to that particular moment in which? It... Yeah, so the IAEA reports, the monthly reports, they also do uh, quarterly reports and others, uh, are a snapshot on that day that they, that they issue the report of what the stockpile is. It's not a snapshot of where it's been or where it's going necessarily, but when we look at that number, it's, it's a fixed date and time. So when you see the snapshot, you tell the Iranians and they can rectify or fix the situation, whatever this it is? This isn't a mystery to anyone. Yeah. It's, okay. They just need to, they need to fix it by June 30th. And I wanted to ask you, your reports uh, uh, that the Israelis are now saying, uh, an Israeli army general in a closed meeting said that the... the, uh, the Iranian Texas stuff just to get out of the way. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. that's... Uh, Let me just finish this one and then I'll go back. Okay. Yeah. No, I just wanted to see if, if you have uh, coordinated with the Israelis or are they beginning to sort of... Uh, reduce their opposition to the Iran deal? Well, I'm certainly not going to comment on uh, reports of closed-door meetings. What I would say is that we have had uh, a, a very large number of conversations and briefings uh, and discussions with the Israelis throughout these nuclear negotiations with Iran uh, at the both political level and the expert level uh, and the intelligence level and a, a number of other levels, diplomatic levels. So those conversations have certainly been ongoing. And I'll go back to Arshad now. Just, uh, 
according to the good ISIS report, <laughs> um, Iran has not fed any low enriched uranium hexafluoride into the EUPP plant mm -hmm. that converts it into the other form right. since November of 2014. If that's correct, then it means that they have not done any conversion for the first five months of this Unless year. Unless there are other ways to convert it, which I just don't know. Okay. I, I thought that they had to do it that way. Um, let me check with our experts. Okay. So that's We're getting the, a, no, another no, I, level down in the weeds here. I, where... I hear you, but it's, I, if one's talking about the question of pace, mm -hmm. then one also has to look at, well, gee, in the previous six-month periods, did they, in fact, do nothing or do it in some different way? Well, and that's why not? I said there are two reasons, I, I think, having talked to our experts, that they believe Iran will be able to, not only the fact that they've done it in the past, but also the technical conversations they're having sure. now about how they're going to proceed. So even if, hypothetically, and I don't know this to be the case, the pace is different, mm -hmm. uh, our experts, uh, based on the conversations now, believe they will be able to do this. Thanks. Yeah. So I also just want to follow up on that. Um, you did say that the, your confidence is based on te these technical discussions taking mm -hmm. place. Is that discussion um, on the stockpiles happening now? Uh, I On the 7650 yeah. or on the th how to get to 300? Because the how to get to 300 conversation is absolutely an ongoing one right. as part of the comprehensive negotiation. And 7650? I, I know we've discussed with them. I'm not sure how ongoing it is, uh, given we believe they have a path forward here to, is, to do this. Is it two things, brief, very briefly. Mm -hmm. Is it your understanding that this U, EU, P, this whole thing is a loaded with acronyms that are completely yes. impossible. Bear with the it, e man. <coughs> the, the UP, the E-U-P-P, -P, is there something wrong with it? Not that I've heard of. I'm happy to check and see if there are more technical details to share. There, right. there may be, there may not be. A lot of this also, I would say, Iran can speak to. Iran <laughs> can and should speak publicly to how they plan to do this. It's noted, not noted. They don't do a daily briefing. I know, but they do so, have a female spokesperson at their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and then the, the, the second I would thing, point out. The second thing in your, in your response. But, they, but really, I mean, I, all joking aside, they also can speak and should speak publicly about how they plan to do this. This is their stockpile they have to get down. Uh, our purpose in uh, defending what's happening here is, is solely to uh, make people understand that the JPOA, uh, which we negotiated, is being upheld and is currently everyone's in compliance. Right. Uh, and one of your mm -hmm. responses to um, one of James's questions, you said something about uh, in an ideal world, you would have this deal, you know, you'd have everyone in compliance on the 30th and the deal yep. would get done. But as we all world. know that we don't live in an ideal world. <laughs> what? Right. I'm holding out. But maybe that. James might live in an ideal world, but the most of the most of the rest <laughs> of us don't, and including it's open late. <laughs> yes, it's open 24. Um, but, yes. but but the rest of us don't have that luxury. That is um, true. And so wouldn't that's which is why I'm going to go back to my question before is wouldn't it be better and more responsible not to say that you're being irresponsible, but wouldn't it be more responsible to, to, to approach this from the standpoint of the skepticism that this ISIS has about whether they can actually do it? We approach uh, our and we calibrate our level of skepticism based on the technical underpinnings of the assessments, Matt. And I'm going to go with my nuclear experts who are out there, uh, who've talked to the IAEA and the IAEA's nuclear experts, who have, you know, eyes on this program, who know, you know, David Albright knows quite a bit about it, but our experts who have been talking to the Iranians and dealing with them every single day for all these years, many months and years now, uh, their assessment is, it's not based on an ideal world, it's based on technical facts, technical realities, technical capabilities, and those conversations they're having with the Iranians. It's not... Okay. Uh, believe me, our experts have a healthy dose of skepticism about many, many issues. I can promise you that for those of you who've met them. Yes. I have a related question <clears throat> okay. to the Iran talks, but first of all, if I can add a personal message, uh, you will be missed. And uh, as a European journalist, uh, I really appreciated your commitment to, to defend and to, to explain the complex uh, U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> Um, not only with clarity, but also with passion and emotion sometimes. So uh, <laughs> I, I wish you all the best for, for, for the rest you. of your career. Thank you. Um, Thank you. 
That said, uh, are you aware? <laughs> I love the transitions in this. This transcript know, is going to be one of my favorite. I just want to say that. About your recent lie. <laughs> I'm um, really going to frame this transcript and put it I, in my I'd office. like to have your thoughts on the, on the meeting who took, uh, which took apparently uh, place yesterday between a former uh, Saudi official, government official, and a former Israeli official, yes. who will be again uh, an Israeli official on Sunday and apparently trying to find mm -hmm. some common grounds against uh, a nuclear deal between the P5 plus one and Iran. So a, a couple of points on that. A, these are reported uh, meetings between private citizens, as you mentioned, and I think they're probably best able to explain uh, their conversations and their remarks. And I also think the governments of Saudi Arabia and Israel are both well able to speak for themselves on this issue, as they have. Uh, as for us, we continue uh, to keep our partners in the region updated as uh, to the status of these negotiations. We've done that uh, many, many, many times uh, with all of our partners, including the Israelis and the Saudis. But were you aware of these discussions between the closed door? I mean, I'm not, we're not asking you, you, you said already you don't want to comment on the closed, right. what, on the discussions, but, but was, the, was the U.S. aware of these closed door meetings? I, or? I'm quite frankly not sure. Again, these were reports about meetings between private citizens. So uh, I'm happy to check with our team and see if there's more to share, um, but I just don't have much more comment on it than that. It's, uh, you know, not, not the non-official statements like Dury Gold and, and Lashke, uh, but official statements, you know, coming out of uh, this uh, closed meeting in Israel, statements by Khaled al Atiyah, the foreign minister of Qatar and so on, they all seem to be on board, for, or they look at the positive aspect of this, of this potential deal. Do you feel that you have overcome the hurdles along the way to sort of getting to the point where this deal is actually signed and sealed? Uh, in terms of what? In terms Support of... Support in the region? Yes, and in terms of, you know, the, the, the deal is done, so to speak. That the nuclear deal is done? Yes, the nuclear deal. The nuclear deal is far from being uh, done, okay. Saeed. So, I would say uh, we have uh, uh, some intense weeks of work ahead of us to see if we can get this finalized. Uh, but I will say, coming out of the GCC meeting at Camp David and other conversations Secretary Kerry's had in the region and others, uh, we believe, and you can just look at the statements coming out of that meeting from our partners in the Gulf, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, they appreciate the incredibly detailed level of briefings that we've given them on these talks, that they believe diplomacy is the best way to solve this. And I do think that uh, those conversations have been very beneficial. As someone who is probably as and much of an expert as anyone can be on this issue, since you've been very closely uh, tied to it, what could possibly, what could potentially sort of sabotage this deal at the end? What could, you know, what could make it unravel? Well, I, I think, uh, look, I think there are an incredible amount of very technical details uh, that have to be worked out to make sure our bottom lines are met, to make sure Iran uh, can get to a place where they support the agreement and all of our P5 plus one partners. Uh, I think there are very tough political decisions that have to be made on many of those technical issues uh, that are not going to be easy. And, and if this were easy, it would have been done months or years ago. So the fact that, again, going back to what I started with, two years ago I was saying at this podium and we weren't even having public meetings with the Iranians about this. Mm -hmm. In that time, we've gotten an agreement that's frozen uh, the progress of their program and rolled it back in some key areas that's led to us being a few weeks away from possibly a comprehensive agreement uh, to, to deal with this issue uh, once and for all. Does that mean we're going to get there? No. But we have the best chance we've ever had uh, for diplomacy to solve this problem. And finally, could this deal... And that's why Secretary Kerry's up on his feet walking around today and committed okay. to a very uh, yeah. rapid recovery. Well, that, that leads to my question. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there a, any kind of likelihood that this deal could be signed at the United Nations, for instance? I, I'm just not going to speculate about locations for the uh, okay. possible ending of these discussions. We can. Um, go to cyber attacks. Yes. Um, can you point to China as being responsible for these cyber attacks? And do you expect this to, has this been raised in any phone calls as the last uh, 24 hours or more? Um, well, this is an active investigation, as you all are aware. The FBI uh, is working with other agencies, including DHS, on this investigation. And at this time, we don't have more details to share publicly about uh, who was behind it. Do you know if you ha if this building has been instructed or if this building has instructed any embassy anywhere to file any kind of a protest or a complaint about wh what what is being investigated uh, i'm just not probably going to have more details on that today 
uh, to share with you. Again, the investigation is ongoing, and we're still gathering all the details. What is the status of the U.S.-China cybersecurity working group? Because it was has been suspended uh, since last year, and in two weeks you're going to have the seventh dialogue. Uh, are there uh, meetings on this subject? Well, you are right. In late June, we will have the seventh uh, SNED, the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, here in Washington. Uh, although China suspended its participation in the cyber working group, we continue to raise our concerns and exchange views with Chinese officials about uh, general cyber issues in a variety of channels. Uh, and certainly, uh, that has been ongoing. But that's a general comment, not related to this specific case. How do you respond to Chinese uh, government's call that such uh, allegation to link with the uh, hacking with the Chinese sponsor hackers are uh, irresponsible. How do you respond to Leo? Well, I certainly haven't uh, prescribed any uh, responsibility uh, from this podium, neither have my colleagues. Again, the active investigation is ongoing. Regardless of whether you're, you're, you or anyone else wants to come out publicly and blame uh, China or any other country or mm -hmm. any, anyone else for, for this, do you foresee there being, <clears throat> because this is out there, um, do you foresee any difficulty uh, with the SNED at all? Uh, as I've said, we're committed to the SNED. It's going forward uh, in the same way it was yesterday. You haven't heard before. anything from the Chinese that they might be less than eager to for full participation. I, I haven't. Given I'm, the accusations, I haven't. Of, I'm happy for the Chinese right. to speak for themselves, though. Anything else on this? Yes. 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 Go ahead. Um, okay. Have you already reached the conclusion who is behind, or you're still? Uh, investigation. The investigation is ongoing. So, uh, could, you, could, you, could you please explain what's the difference of, um, because this is not economic espionage or other, like, attack we mentioned before. This is targeting the U.S. federal government. Mm -hmm. So, would you consider this as intelligence gathering as the U.S. government is also doing around the world? Well, any offensive cyber uh, attack, we've seen this before on the U.S. government. We've seen this at the State Department, as we've talked about before. Uh, obviously, it's something we take very seriously. It's a threat we take very seriously. We take mitigation steps in the U.S. government uh, to, to certainly prevent this kind of thing from happening. Yes, but James. Is the SNED discussions in any way? Again, it's moving forward. We're held. Uh, it's being held in, in late June here uh, in Washington. The Secretary will be there. Uh, and we remain committed to, to moving forward with the SNED. James, yes. Has the investigation to date made any progress toward determining the origins of these attacks? I, I, you'd have to check with the FBI on that. Um, is it uh, a serious concern for U.S. national security? Well, certainly any time uh, personal information, this really was focused on personal information of federal employees, uh, is, uh, falls into hands it should not be in. That's a security concern uh, for the variety of nefarious ways it can be used. I think OPM spoke a little bit more specifically to what was taken and how that could impact security. And in this case, it's not just any set of federal officials, but federal officials specifically with clearances, correct? Uh, I can check with OPM on that. I'm not positive on that. I mean, there's a difference if 100 uh, National Security Council employees have their personal data breached and uh, 100 uh, employees at the Agriculture Department, for example, I, I understand. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me check on that. I'm not sure about that. Although from a personal security standpoint, uh, anyone getting information that's personal and being able to impersonate a federal government employee, regardless of what department they work in, would be concerning to us, certainly. But those with clearances, as we're led to understand, was the situation in this case. Uh, could then be susceptible to coercion or blackmail on that basis. And I think that's what occasions the even greater concern here. Do you understand? Uh, I understand. I, I just, I'm sorry, I can't confirm the piece about it was people with, uh, with um, security clearances. In other words, we hear all the time about breaches of data, it seems anyway. And I just wonder if this instance is more serious than the others, or most. I can't remember a similar situation happening uh, to federal government employees, certainly, across the board. I just, I just can't remember, certainly since I've been, been here. Marie, Roz, yes. Marie, the uh, Chinese government has objected to the suggestion from some in the U.S. government that hackers with links to the Chinese government may have been behind the security breach, and they've been pretty forceful about it. What do you, as a representative of the U.S. government, say to them that the U.S. has not actually decided who did this? Well, that's why I just said very clearly the investigation is ongoing, and I'm not going to prescribe blame for that at this point. But certainly by uh, the time we got to 7 o'clock Eastern yesterday evening, 
there were numerous reports, numerous unnamed sources from other parts of the U.S. government mm -hmm. who were leaving the impression that they had every reason to think that the Chinese had something to do with it. Doesn't that create some level of tension? Well, again, I'm not going to speculate on what drives people anonymously to go out and, and talk about these kinds of issues. As I've said, the investigation is ongoing, and as we have facts to share about it, uh, we'll make a decision about what makes sense to share publicly. Rogers' question is an interesting one, which is, do, 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 do the mere appearance of such reports create tension? And, uh, you know, even if there's an investigation going on, is there any tension that you're aware of between the U.S. and Chinese governments simply over the reports, regardless of their veracity? I'm happy to check with our team on this. I haven't heard of any. I'm happy to check. I, Change topics? Oh, wait. I'll let's stay on one more on this. I'm yes. not sure I have is much there, more to say. Is there any initial indication of the impact of the data breach on the State Department specifically? So OPM has said they will be contacting current and former federal employees who uh, were affected by this. I know they're in the process of doing that right now, and I don't want to get ahead of that process. Yesterday, the Taiwanese uh, DPP presidential candidate came to uh, State Department to visit Deputy Secretary Blinken. Uh, do you have any readout? And because it didn't happen before, does this mean that U.S. government has adjusted its uh, policy guideline to interact with the Taiwanese government well, or politician? We, our position has not changed. Uh, we, we appreciate uh, that Democratic uh, Progressive Party chairwoman uh, visited here. Uh, we had constructive exchange on a wide range of issues with her. Our policy has not changed. Uh, from time to time, we do meet uh, with uh, Taiwanese officials. Certainly, the secretary has and others have as well in this building. So, uh, I'm not sure that's true. Actually, I'm happy to go back and check. Okay, please. We do. We have met. I know that uh, uh, before, and I'm happy to check uh, where those meetings took place. But our position in no way has changed on Taiwan. Yes. Up on that, um, how do you respond to the Chinese government's call that the, uh, the meeting is sending the wrong signal to, um, to Taiwan? Well, again, our policy hasn't changed. We have developed a strong, unofficial relationship with Taiwan. Uh, this is based on the One China policy, the three, three joint communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, things we've talked about for years and years and years now. So uh, really, there's been no change in our policy here. Uh, Are you Go ahead. Are you confident of the uh, peace and st stability across the Taiwan Strait in coming years? Well, we certainly have an abiding interest in peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, and that uh, is certainly something we've encouraged both officials in Beijing and Taipei to continue their efforts uh, that support cross-strait stability. How would you characterize, you know, Chairman Tsai's meeting here with a uh, different official? Well, as I just said, we had a constructive exchange on a wide range of issues with her. Marie, regardless of whether or not the policy has or hasn't changed, and it, it, you say it hasn't, so. It has. Okay, exactly. Mm -hmm. But uh, you must have realized that having this kind of a meeting in this building was going to <clears throat> raise the ire of the Chinese, no? Uh, Matt, I'm not sure I have much more to say on this. We have an unofficial uh, and a strong unofficial relationship with Taiwan, and this is just part of that I understand unofficial that, but, relationship. But, but you know how sensitive the Chinese are about, the, are about this issue, which is why mm -hmm. for decades the guidance on Taiwan always has the three communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, and, and the One China long Policy, after I'm gone from this which podium, is I'm exactly, sure. and which is why in every single meeting that you have, that the secretaries, secretaries of state have with the Chinese, mm -hmm. this goes, is gone through in, mm -hmm. in rote form. That said, given that, didn't, wasn't there any kind of an awareness that meeting with a Taiwanese official in this building was going to cause some angst? I'm not sure this, we see this as different from other meetings we've had with Taiwanese officials in this unofficial uh, relationship we have. So I'm happy to check and see if there's more to say on this. Put it a slightly different way. There's nothing in the communiques or the other documents that were just referenced here that prevent the United States from conducting meetings in this building or elsewhere with no. Taiwanese officials, correct. correct? That is correct. And we've done so uh, for a long time. Saeed, yes. Can we move uh, to another topic? Today marks the 48th anniversary. I think there's a, hold on, one more. Right. Uh, in, Marie, in your recollection, when is the last time the Taiwanese official or presidential hopeful was meeting with the State Department official at this building? At this building. I'm happy to check. I know we've had many meetings with Taiwanese officials uh, in a variety of places. Uh, that we've talked about publicly. I'm, I'm happy to check on that. Saeed. I have 
she I think we're gonna move on. Now I don't have much more to the, say. The same question. Same okay. Question. Yeah. Yep. So I've, did she meet with the Deputy Secretary Anthony Kling, 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 uh, Blinken? I, yes, I'm not going to confirm the details uh, of her meetings here. Yes. I realize this is harping a bit on this, but you know, it's, why would the last day be any different? Exactly. But I mean, you look, did start on time. That suggested redemption for all sinners. Aren't so. you proud of me today? <laughs> I was actually ready like five minutes early. I was just hanging Punctuality. out. Punctuality. The Chinese get upset when you meet the, with when the president meets with the Dalai Lama as well, uh, and you know, and you and you expect them to get angry about it, and you're willing to take that hit. So my question is simply the same as what I asked before, which is that what, weren't you aware that this was going to cause consternation in Beijing? And if you could take the question or yeah. have someone look into it, okay. that would be great. Thank I'm not you. sure he'll have much more to say on that. I'm just going to take a lot of questions today <coughs> for Jeff on Monday. Yes, well, Saeed. Yeah. With that, I'm sure want, he's I, I want, I want to add my, my voice to Nicola and thank you. thank you for always being there and being responsive and so on. And. Uh, uh, as he said, having said this, I want to ask you on the, you know, on this occasion, which is the 48th anniversary of the occupation of the West Bank, uh, half of that time the United States has been involved in trying to reach some sort of a resolution. I mean, I want to ask you, how much longer should the Palestinians wait under occupation before they, they have this occupation end? Well, I think if you if I've learned anything in these last two years, Said, it's how committed this administration, Secretary Kerry, is to seeing, despite enormous odds, if we can get some movement towards a two-state solution. You all have been through all of this uh, with us uh, throughout those last two years, certainly, and it's difficult. And the two parties have to take steps to show uh, they are willing to move forward here. But we are certainly incredibly committed to seeing. Uh, if we can do it, we can't do it for them. We can't want it more than they do. Um, but it certainly remains a top priority. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have taken the leadership. I mean, you know, the president said the other day that uh, Israel will lose credibility if the settlements, he told the Israeli press, or to the Israeli channel too, if they continue with their settlement and occupation and so on. What about your credibility? I mean, you have taken the lead on this since at least 1991. Well, the reason the United States has taken a lead is because we believe it's important to have people who can bring both sides to the table to encourage both sides to not take steps that escalate tensions or that make peace more difficult, uh, and that we've been a, a, a party that's been able to play a role in that, certainly. That doesn't mean it's easy, certainly. And that's, I think, another thing we've learned, again, over these past few years. And finally, uh, Human Rights Watch issued a report yesterday or the day before saying that uh, you and the Israelis are trying to exert pressure on, the, on Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, not to, uh, to remove or to, to, uh, to remove Israel from, let's say, the list of shame for mistreating children and people in prison under the occupation. Are you exerting a lot of pressure well, on the United Nations? I, I honestly hadn't seen that report, uh, so I'm not going to speak to the specifics in it. But generally, we have stood up uh, for Israel uh, in international fora, including the UN. Uh, when they are unfairly singled out uh, in a way that other countries are not. Um, but again, I haven't seen that specific report, and I don't want to comment on that specific issue. Going back yes. to, to same, go the front and then around. same subject, mm -hmm. but going back to, or same area, but going back to the whole orange yes. France thing from yesterday. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I believe former Mr. Fabius has spoken to this now as well. Yeah. But uh, he talked about, <laughs> yeah. well, he talked about France as opposed to boycotts. But this really isn't a boycott, is it? Do you regard what Orange did or is going to do I or wants Orange to do? I think Orange may have also spoken to their future plans you, as well. Exactly. Do you regard and that? And said they as, may not be going forward. Yeah. Do you regard what was being discussed or what has been discussed as a boycott or something that you would oppose? Or is it just a private company doing what? Private companies well, do. as a matter of principle, the U.S. opposes boycotts directed at the State of Israel. I said that yesterday. We've said this for many, many months and years now. Um, I'm not familiar with the exact details of what these alleged plans that Orange was going to do were. And private companies, you are right, can make their own decisions about uh, their own businesses. That so, doesn't mean we can't oppose boycotts. We, of course, do. Yeah, but I'm. What, what I'm I call. Saying, what so they if propose, I, if Company X does business in Israel and wants to pull out and no longer do business in Israel because uh, it re is getting pressure from its shareholders or whoever uh, about settlement activity or the activity of the Israeli government in, in the West Bank or Gaza, 
that you do not have a problem with that. Is that correct? Well, no, it's, that's not what I'm saying. We oppose, you're looking for a definition of boycott, I think. Probably. No, I'm trying to because, find out if- Well, what, we, if oppose, you... we oppose boycotts of the state of Israel, directed at the state of that. Israel. Now, we oppose them. We also understand private companies can make their own decisions. That doesn't mean we won't oppose those decisions. If that makes sense. So, so without knowing oppose. Company X or Company X's rationale or the or the details behind what Company X is going to do, I just can't venture to guess hypothetically what we would say. But as a principle, we oppose boycotts directed to the state of Israel. Well, does that mean, though, that then you would encourage every company in the world that has an international branch to do business with Israel? Uh, or, and that if they don't, that that's a I'm bad thing? I'm not sure the context Or is it is just true. pulling out? We, what is it that you are opposed to oppose in terms of boycotts? I understand that, but in terms of private companies, right? We oppose boycotts. They just mean they have to do. I know, but a private company taking itself out of a market isn't a boycott. Well, again, I, it's, without knowing the details, I have no idea why that private company would be taking themselves out of that market. There could be business. So reasons. it's a case by case basis. Is that what you're saying? Well, to determine whether or not something is a boycott, yes, it would be a case by case basis. Right. I think. If but it's not if, if we determine something is a boycott aimed at the state of Israel, we do not we oppose that. We support that. We do not support that. You know, absent any kind of political process or any hope for the Palestinians, why not, you know, why not support the boycott? After all, it is really a peaceful kind of resistance. It does bring pressure. It has worked in the past. It's something that may force the Israelis to do something that you want them to do, which is pull out of occupied areas. We just don't support this. Our position on this is long standing and will not change. Yes. Um, this is uh, a question or a set of questions relating to the decision making surrounding uh, the, dis uh, the release of six longtime inmates at Guantanamo mm -hmm. Bay Detention Center to the state of Uruguay in December 2014, decision making in which the State Department participated. Correct, along with five other uh, agencies. departments and agencies. That's yes. right. Um, when these six inmates, whom we will call for the purpose of our discussion, the Uruguay Six, okay. uh, were dispatched to Uruguay. Uh, the State Department's special envoy for the closure of Guantanamo, Cliff mm -hmm. Sloan, wrote on Department of State letterhead to Uruguay's president to assure him, and I quote, there is no information that the above mentioned individuals, meaning the Uruguay Six, mm -hmm were involved in conducting or facilitating terrorist activities against the United States or its partners or allies, unquote. And yet, on the books, thanks to WikiLeaks, uh, is a large set of uh, DOD assessments of uh, Guantanamo inmates uh, that is now published on the New York Times online archive um, from 2007-2008 that encompass the Uruguay Six. And the DOD assessments of 2007-2008 concluded that five of the Uruguay six posed a high risk for release because they would likely pose a threat to the U.S. and its interests and its allies. Um, the uh, DOD assessment for one of the Uruguay six, mm -hmm. Mr. Orgi, um, concluded in June 2007, and I quote, detainee participated in hostilities against U.S. and coalition forces, end quote. Mm -hmm. um, it further goes on to say that that particular individual um, was a senior explosives trainer for al-Qaeda, had prior knowledge of the 9-11 attacks, uh, and had reported associations with senior al-Qaeda members, including Osama bin Laden. I just wonder if you can explain how we get to a situation mm -hmm. in which the Department of Defense concludes that a particular detainee, quote, participated in hostilities against U.S., and coalition forces, and lo, lo and behold, five years later, Cliff Sloan of this agency, this department, could assure the head of state mm -hmm. of Uruguay there is no information that the above-mentioned individuals were involved in conducting or facilitating, facilitating yep. terrorist activities. Well, I would also note, and I'm going to go through a little bit on this case, the Department of Defense later then uh, joined with the five other agencies and departments in unanimously approving them for transfer. So the Defense Department's official position uh, when they were up for transfer was to approve that. So the Defense Department's position changed. I mean, you'd have to ask them. I don't know if these assessments were the Defense Department's position or just sort of assessments that were part of a larger body of information. You'd have to ask them. Um, but the six detainees transferred had been approved for transfer for nearly five years prior to their transfer in December 2014. They were approved for transfer uh, through the Executive Office Task Force process. It includes representatives from state, 
Defense, Justice, Homeland Security, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, this rigorous interagency process collected and considered all reasonably available information considering, uh, concerning these detainees in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, the decision to approve a detainee for transfer required the unanimous consensus of these six departments and agencies, including the Defense Department, and reflects the best predictive judgment of senior government officials that any threat posed by the detainee can be sufficiently mitigated through feasible, feasible and appropriate security measures in the receiving country, uh, as we've said uh, many, many times. Okay, so in the course of your answer, you yourself just now went from saying you didn't know if DOD had changed its position well, to telling us that- Well, I don't know if what you're quoting was their official position or just information they had. I know uh, when they came up, uh, when the decision was made, uh, they should be transferred. It was the unanimous decision of all the six agencies, including the Defense Department. I don't know if they had a different position before then or if they just had information you're referencing. No, the, the official assessment of the Department of Defense as is now accessible online. I, again, I haven't seen that document. All I know is that when in the official interagency process determining whether someone should be transferred, uh, the Defense Department was supportive. Last question on this. Would you at least agree that there is a stark difference between uh, our government saying that a given detainee uh, participated um, in hostilities against U.S. and coalition forces, and our government saying that a given date detainee, there is no information that the above mentioned individual was involved in conducting or facilitating terrorist activities. They would seem to be, to any mm -hmm. commonsensical mm -hmm. approach, starkly divergent assessments of the same individual, correct? And well, a couple of points here. First, I, ha I really haven't seen this assessment that you're that you're quoting from, so I don't want to uh, speak for the Defense Department or speak for that assessment that I just haven't seen. Uh, we certainly stand by the information in Special Envoy Sloan's letter. Uh, and again, uh, this uh, task force takes all of the information that's available to them concerning detainees and considers all of it when determining transfers uh, and why people are allowed to be transferred. Uh, there are some possible explanations, which I would let others who, you know, at DOD speak to. Perhaps the additional information, there was additional information that showed the previous information was incorrect. I don't know that to be the case, but, you know, there may have been. Uh, there was an assessment made based on all of the pieces of information uh, that they could be released, that the threat, that any threat uh, could be mitigated, and we stand by what was said in Special Envoy Sloan's letter. Last question. Representative Ed Royce, Republican of California, mm -hmm. Chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, wrote to Assistant Secretary Fryfield on May 20, uh, requesting access to the 2009 interagency assessment for the Uruguay Six, and also copies of all correspondence from Mr. Sloan to any other heads of state containing uh, assurances that were similar to those uh, contained in Mr. Sloan's letter to the President of Uruguay. Mr. Royce informs Fox News he has not received any reply to that letter. Is there a reply to that uh, letter? We reply to every letter we get from Congress, so I am confident someone's working on it. Um, but in terms of one of the specific questions, I can say we're not aware of any additional letters from the Office of the Special Envoy uh, to foreign governments that are similar to the one that you mentioned. But Thank you. Do you I'm know sure we will respond to base, Chairman Royce. Uh, uh, on this issue, do you know if this assessment, the DOD assessment, uh, that James is referring to was that one of the pieces of information that I, was available. I'm not familiar to with the, the, what he's specifically I referring know. to, but as I said, this interagency team uh, collected <clears throat> and considered all reasonable available information that they that anyone had. So I would imagine anything that dealt with any of these six was considered. Right. I know which this is a, which would include that. If that it document. was if it was about one of these detainees, then yes, it would have. How, okay. how is it that just a simple question? How is it that the United States government could have imprisoned so many people for such a long time with, without actually having evidence that it itself found persuasive they should be incarcerated. How, how is this Well, um, it's a, a very good question, Arshad. I think we inherited, this administration inherited a situation uh, where there were a large number of detainees in Guantanamo. And as you know, one of the president's top priorities has been closing Guantanamo. And to do that, you have to transfer detainees that can be 
uh, transferred in a way that they don't pose a threat or that that threat can be mitigated, as we've talked about. Uh, that requires a pretty lengthy diplomatic process and talking to other countries, um, making sure other countries are willing uh, to accept these detainees. Often they don't go back to their home countries for a variety of reasons. There's a, a group of people that have been identified that can be charged and prosecuted, and those are moving forward. And then there's a group in the middle uh, that uh, might be uh, put forward with charges but haven't been yet. And so determining the final outcome of what will happen to them is ongoing. But I mean, on top of that, we've had incredibly restrictive congressional uh, action that has made it much more difficult for us to move forward closing Guantanamo. This really is one of the situations we inherited uh, in this administration when the president took office that uh, we have worked very, very hard to rectify. Um, but the problem is you have a lot of detainees and there need to be some place for them to go. The, one, the ones you can transfer, the ones you can't, the ones you can charge, and, and unfortunately, Congress has put incredibly restrictive limitations on what we can do to get this thing actually closed. Put it, putting the onus, as you seem to be doing on the previous administration, in part, though, in part, suggests that only in part. Suggests, I'm also putting a lot of it on Congress. Suggests though that these guys were once, or at least one of them. Were, were, were deemed, was deemed to be a serious threat, and then I'm not going to speak to why they incarcerated deemed people to be a serious threat, which suggests that the bar no I, for determining was lowered by this administration not at all. in order not at to all. carry out what the president wanted to do. Not at all. I would I would say a few things. First, uh, the recidivism numbers under this administration, because of the strict uh, guidelines we've put in place for transfer, have dropped. Since January of 2009, they have dropped uh, for those returning to the battlefield. So if you look at the recidivism numbers, actually the opposite of what you're arguing is true. And we can get those all around to you again. Second, uh, again, I can't speak to that assessment that James is quoting. Uh, I can't speak to any one piece of information that may have argued something about someone in Guantanamo. And I certainly can't speak to why they were incarcerated in the first place. What I can speak to is the process we in this administration and believe me, the people that do this at the Defense Department and the intelligence community take this incredibly seriously. They will not sign off on someone to be transferred unless they are confident we can prevent them from being a threat to the U.S. But you can speak to a body of information. And in fact, the uh, particulars of this 2007 DOD assessment about this particular detainee I provided to you in advance of the briefing. And that assessment? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm uh, sorry. I didn't see the assessment. I, just... uh, I provided the, the specific quotes that I read off to you. Okay. Um, I haven't seen the whole thing. I'm sorry. I'd have to but, take uh, a look at the whole thing. Uh, it, you would have to acknowledge, just on hearing it from, from me and assuming that I'm not uh, misrepresenting the facts in this briefing, um, a large you, you would have to, it, because I live in an <laughs> ideal world, um, you, <laughs> you, you would, <laughs> if you're in the briefing room, then you're not in an ideal world. Um, Hey. No, I'm joking. Uh, you would have to agree that there is a large body of information about this particular detainee that would have to be overlooked or overcome somehow well, to result in saying he poses no okay, risk. Okay, but let's say two, two points here. First, you're quoting one assessment. I don't know if I would call that a large body of information. You're quoting one piece of information. But I guess I would put the question back on the Defense Department then. You're quoting information of theirs. They are part of an inter interagency team. They were one of the people that approved this detainee for transfer. So I can only speak to the fact that there was a process done for these individuals that looked at all available information, and all of those agencies approved them for transfer. Including yours, and that's why. And I'm including the Defense Department, though. So if you think there's a contradiction between their assessments, I would probably point you to them. Can I? Yes. Let's move on. <clears throat> And they, they announced the uh, the next G7 site for 2016, and it's going to be near this uh, this historical shrine that's important to the Imperial family. And I was wondering if, if uh, maybe you're looking forward to you know the. Um, I hadn't seen that announcement. I always look forward to the G7, though. I will um, tell you. Now, do you have any thoughts on this, the fact that it's Lubeck not going to be? Lubeck was lovely. It was. Yes, go ahead. Any, any thoughts on the fact that it's not going to be in Hiroshima and that the delegation... I, I don't have much more assessment of the location of the G7 for you. Yes. Um, I have some question on the upcoming general election in Turkey. Okay. On this Sunday. Um, AKP, the ruling party, is reported to be leading at the moment, but PKK is also expected to win, win some seats as well. Um, and some reports say that there are some disagreements between U.S. and Turkey over Syria, as in the U.S. is focused 
on fighting ISIL, but Turkey is more, more focused on getting rid of the Assad regime. Um, so do you think the um, election results are going to influence U.S.-Turkey cooperation in dealing with the situation in Syria and ISIL? I'm certainly not going to hypothesize before an election has even taken place. Uh, we believe that, look, in any democracy, the electorate should have the opportunity to make informed choices about parties or candidates or platforms. And uh, that's certainly what we're looking for to happen here. And I have two more questions. Okay. <laughs> um, if the AKP wins enough seats, um, it'll try to implement a new constitution that would increase Erdogan's presidential powers. Aren't you concerned at all? I'm just this? not going to speculate on the outcome of the election. Oh, and also one more, sorry, one more question on Turkey and Syria. Um, mm -hmm. What about reports indicating that Turkey is joining with Saudi Arabia and helping extremist groups such as al-Nusra in order to topple the Assad regime? Do you have any comments on this? Um, I mean, we've talked about this for a long time. Turkey is a key part of our anti-ISIL coalition. Uh, they have been helping in a number of fronts, including uh, to crack down on foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, and really, beyond that, I don't have much more to share. Very yes, well, Kate. Independent of the election, yes. how do you react to reports that Turkey has been quite active in ferrying jihadis and so on into Syria ever since this rebellion took place back in 2011? Well, I think we've said for some time that we've been working with the Turks on how to increasingly crack down on foreign terrorist fighters along their border. Uh, and they've taken steps. Uh, certainly, uh, they have uh, understand this is a problem, but there is a lot more that they could do, certainly. We've talked about this with them. I think they've said so publicly. So it's an issue we're certainly working on together. So do you think that Turkey has been aiding and abetting the, the entry of uh, foreign jihadis into Syria Tur all along? Turkey has been a key partner in this anti-ISIL coalition, uh, period, Saeed. This has been something uh, we've worked with them quite a bit on. It's a tough challenge. It's a porous border. It's a long border. <laughs> And it's one we're working with them on. Reports that keep saying they support an Nusra, which you have placed on the, you know, the terror list, mm -hmm. and not really fighting uh, and, and aiding, not fighting ISIL. I, do, you, do you agree with that? As I've said, they are a, a valuable partner, and they count our ISIL coalition, and I don't have much more to add. What about, what about Turkish president's crackdown on, the, on critics in Turkey? The latest came this week when he accused the editor of Jumhuriyet, which is a very major newspaper in Turkey, of espionage. And his lawyer, Erdogan's lawyer, has filed a criminal lawsuit against the editor of Jumhuriyet. Aren't you concerned about the way Erdogan, ahead of the election, is cracking down well, on the Well, as I said a couple times this week, an independent and unfettered media is an essential element of any democratic and open society. Uh, we support freedom of expression, certainly. We've been concerned and remain concerned about government interference in freedom of expression in Turkey. Uh, and urge Turkish, Turkish authorities to ensure that their actions uphold democratic values, including freedom of expression. Anything else on Turkey? Yeah, yeah. I just, okay, I'll go to Syria. But well, we'll I just Turkey. want to know, do you, if you're speaking out on this, do you have anything to say about the, the spat with the opposite, Erdogan's spat with the opposition later over whether this palace has golden toilets or not? I, I don't think I have anything to say on that. Yes. 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 Do you have any comment yes. about what uh, been reported today that the Russian are evacuating some of their staff from Latakia? Uh, I don't have any comment on those. I have just haven't seen them. And, sure. Leslie. Can you comment on the um, um, eight out of the, these reports that eight out of the ten men um, jailed for the attempt assassination of Manala um, uh, have been released? Yes, so we've seen them and we're trying to get some more information. It appeared it may have happened some time ago or a few weeks ago at least. We're trying to get a little more information on this uh, and we'll have probably more to say when we do. Obviously, we uh, absolutely want uh, those responsible uh, to be brought to justice. We also have repeatedly called on Pakistan to ensure due process in general on this case and others, but we just don't have much more on this specifically. Yes, and then Abigail. Yeah. On, uh relations between the U.S. and Cuba, has mm -hmm. the administration decided yet when to notify Congress about its decision to open an embassy? We ha I don't think we're probably going to share that publicly before we share it with Congress. We just don't have any updates for you on that. Are there any plans for uh, another round of meetings, or do technical discussions continue on the outstanding issues? We don't have any date for another round, and I just don't have much more detail about what happens next. Abigail. Uh, following up from yesterday, mm -hmm. do you have any response to the letter from Representative Chaffetz and Bella to the Secretary asking about the security situation in certain cities in Mexico? In Mexico. Uh, I got a little <clears throat> bit on that. Uh, of course, uh, we take security situation very seriously, uh, no matter where. 
Uh, that certainly includes uh, Mexico. We take every threat seriously, certainly. Um, we constantly assess our security needs. Uh, we've also said that multiple times, but we think it's important to have a diplomatic representation in these places and locations, and that's why uh, we do. And I, you know, remind people that millions of U.S. citizens safely visit Mexico each year uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so that, I think, uh, is one of the reasons it's so important for us to have a very robust diplomatic presence, uh, aid to help American citizens who are there, but also to engage with the Mexican government. And one of the questions the letter asks is about the uh, elimination of danger pay for employees working in those consulates and areas that they say the security situation is deteriorating. Do you have any response to that question? Uh, I don't. I mean, I know in general how danger pay is, is determined. It's one of the allowances that may be provided at a post depending on the conditions at the post related to terrorism and political violence. Uh, I don't have much more to say on that. We regularly review uh, all of our allowances to evaluate whether they're appropriate, and again, we'll respond. But in general, that's what I know on danger pay. Okinawa. Uh, yesterday, I asked you, but you don't, didn't uh, answer yet. So, uh, Okinawa Governor Onoga uh, say he will uh, be visited at Washington D.C. again, and he and also he want to meet with the U.S. officer again. So. Um, does the U.S. government and continue to uh, dialogue, hold dialogue with the governor? Well, we just had uh, a meeting uh, with the Okinawa governor. I don't have any future meetings to preview for you, certainly. So, uh, continue to the dialogue. We with just the had. Governor? I mean, we just had a meeting. I know officials on the on the ground uh, at our embassy certainly dialogue with a wide range of people there, but I don't have any specifics to share. What else? Anything else? Yeah. Uh, is there any update on the t discussions with the gutteries about the... There's not. The restrictions are staying on Gitmo. The restrictions remain in place uh, while the discussions are ongoing. Are you aware of any effort to recruit those Taliban Five, so-called, uh, since their release? Uh, well, what I can say since their release is that none of the five individuals has returned to the fat battlefield. All five men are subject to a travel ban, and none have left Qatar. None of the individuals has engaged in physical violence. Many actions have been taken to restrict their activities, of course. Uh, and so I know there was a lot of discussion about this earlier, about their possible reengagement, and none of the five uh, have returned to the battlefield. That speaks to the outcome, but I wonder if you could speak to the, the question that's been raised about inputs. Whether anyone's tried to, I, I can't speak to that. I just know that they have not returned to the battlefield. The discussions remain ongoing. That's it. Uh, enjoy your new job. And we all will still be talking, <laughs> um, particularly about Iran. So I'm sure we will all have a, a lot of contacts still going forward. And you'll see me around, so don't hesitate to come say hi. And thank you, guys. Thank you.